name is high and holy. Your name is great and magnificent and awesome. And we just thank you that we have the privilege to call upon your name. Yeah. Hallelujah. And not only do we know your name, but we thank you that you know our name. Hallelujah. Yeah. Can you just say, Lord, you know my name? God, you know my name. Hallelujah.
and we were very, very successful at what we did. So thank you so much for being here this morning. If you would, please. Uh, that's right, give him half that. Amen. If you would stand, please, one more time. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, the second chapter of Acts. And we're going to read verses 43 through 47. 43 through 47. And the word says this. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having a favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, as should be saved. My text today is, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. Let us pray. Father, we bless you this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for who you are in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for your power. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, that you have ordered our stuff and you have brought us to this house today to worship you, God. To worship and to praise you and to magnify you, O God. To magnify you above every circumstance, every situation that we may be facing, O God. Because we know, Lord God, that with you, all things are possible. Yeah. So we put everything into your hands, O oh God. We're angels for nothing. We believe and we trust in you, O oh God. So Father, we thank you today for those that are gathered and those that are watching online. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that the word will minister to the hearts of every hearer. But not just let them hear, O oh God. Let them be doers. Let them be practitioners. Let us be practitioners of your word, O oh God. Father, we thank you for this. Hide me behind the cross, not about me, but all about you. There no flesh go in your presence. It is a spirit that quickens the flesh, Father, nothing, and the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated. In the second chapter of, of Acts, there is uh, the account of the Holy Spirit. There is the account of the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost. And they were all gathered in one room. Holy Spirit came and, and uh, filled the place, and men that were there uh, in this one place were uh, started to speak in the unknown tongue. It's something about coming together. Yeah. It's something about gathering in one place. It's something about the Holy Spirit. When we gather in one place, things start to happen. Amen? And so there they are. They're gathering in this one place. The Holy Spirit comes and enters the hearts of the people. And this is the same thing that Joel had prophesied in Joel 2.28, that the, spirit, uh, the Lord will pour his spirit upon every man. And so here we see that the Holy Spirit has come. And um, as these people were listening to them speaking, they started to wonder, who are these people? Are they drunk? What have they been doing? And, and they seemed like they were drunk because every man was speaking in his own language. And so they were asking questions about, who, who, what, what are they doing here? And they started to doubt what they were saying. But Peter started to do something. Peter started to start to preach. You know, when it comes to a church, there are certain things that have to be in place. And one of the things that have to be in place is there has to be a preacher that has to be in place. Amen? And so Peter stands up and, and Peter starts to preach and Peter starts to tell them about Jesus Christ. Peter starts to tell them about the wonders that have been done, how Jesus had been raised from the dead. And then in verse 32, Peter says this. He said, this Jesus has God raised up whereof we are witnesses, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And Peter's just preaching them, telling them what's, what's taking place. But what's really taking place here is the account of the first churches is being birthed. The first church is being birthed. And the first church couldn't be birthed without the Holy Spirit coming uh, into our lives. Amen. Amen. And so Peter's preaching. So in every church, there has to be a preacher. Yes. In every church, there has to be a teacher. Amen. There has to be somebody that can expound on the word of God and teach people the truth. Not taking the word of God and watering it down, but teaching the pure, unadulterated word of God. Because that's how people get saved. Right. When we take the word of God and we start to change it, people can't be saved. Mm -hmm. Because it's just not the real doctrine. But when we teach the divine truth, hearts and minds are changed and they're changed forever. 
Amen? And so Peter is preaching, and there's just not only is there a priest, but now there's a congregation. There is an assembly of people. So when a church, there has to be an assembly of people. Like people are gathered here today, like people gather online. There has to be an assembly of people where people come together in like-mindedness, come together in, in, in fellowship and in, in holiness. Amen? And in every church, in every church, two things should exist when it comes to people. There should be believers, and there should be non-believers. Right. Believers who are the proof that, that Christ has died for our sins and they have given their lives to Christ and change has taken place and they become a testimony of what God has done in our lives. Yeah. Amen? I'm a testimony of what God's done in my life. You're a testimony of what God has done in your life. But not only do you have to have believers, but you have to have non-believers. Why well, you have to have non-believers? Because somebody needs to be saved. Yeah. And we don't have believers in the church, non-believers in the church, and people aren't being saved. So the body of Christ can't grow, and it's just staying stagnated. So even though we're in a pandemic, we still need non-believers so the word can be preached to them, their hearts can be changed, and the body can grow, and then they can also develop. Amen. Amen? So we need, we need both. Yes. And as Paul was preaching, and Paul was teaching uh, about Christ, as he's teaching, the Bible says this, it says in, in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They were pricked. In other words, their hearts were agitated. And, and, and in other words, something had taken place in their hearts to cause them to want to change. And they're looking and trying to figure out what, what, what is this word that's being taught here? What, what's causing me to stop and, and pause? What is this that's piercing me? See, when the word of God is being preached and word of God is being taught, there's a piercing that takes place yeah. in our hearts. When we hear the word of God and, this is, and grab the word of God, there is something that pricks our hearts. It's something that pierces our hearts that now causes us to want to change and say, like these men said, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. When you come to a church and you're somewhere together and the word's going forth and there are non-believers, People say, what can I do to challenge? I don't know about you, but I remember going to church when I was saved and hearing the word of God, and it was pricking my heart. And, and, and there were times where I knew I should have gotten up and gone down front. Then there were times I said, I'm not ready. Yeah. I'm not ready. Many, many of us have done that. But when that word just keep on pricking your heart, keep on agitating your heart, keep on piercing your heart, at some point you just say, well, I can't do it anymore. Amen. Lord, I'm yours. I'm, whatever you want me to do, I'm, I'm yours. I'm willing to give myself wholly unto you. So they were pressing their, piercing their hearts. And then the Bible says that uh, they asked the question, what shall I do? And, and Peter and the rest of the apostles looked at them and he said unto them that you must repent. Mm -hmm. See, when it comes to hearing the word of God, your heart being pricked, then it has to be repentance. Repentance is changing your life, changing a total turnabout. It's not a 160 degree turn. It's a 360 degree turn. Yeah. Not a 180 degree, it's 360 degree turn. Amen? And so there's a change that takes place. And the change that takes place is a change that people can see. It's a visible change. It's a change on the inside, but it's manifested on the outside. Amen. So people start to see that there's a difference in you. You start to talk different. You start to walk different. You start to think different. You start to do different. Something about you just starts to change. Amen? Amen. So what must we do to be saved? And he said to them, you must repent and be baptized and and then for the remission of your sins, he says, and then he leads them in prayer and says, then you must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because once you repent, once you're baptized, then there's the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes to live on the inside of us because Jesus said this. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. Amen. I will not leave you as orphans. He says that he will send the Spirit. I can't, he can't come until I ascend, but when I ascend, I'm going to send the Spirit to comfort you. The paraclete is one to be by your side, the one to live on the inside of you. Yeah. And so the Holy Spirit has come to live on the inside of us, and each and every one of us that are saved, the Holy Spirit has come to live on the inside of us. And then he didn't just stop there. He spoke many more words. Mm -hmm. Many more words testifying of Christ. Many more words exalting Christ, because when you come to church, you want to hear Christ exalted. Amen. It's not about exalting a man. It's not about exalting a woman. It's not about exalting anybody in church. It's about testifying about Christ and his goodness Amen. and all the wonderful things that he's done. And he's just speaking about Christ, not about himself. He's telling everything about Christ and what he has done. Yeah. And we all be grateful for what he's done. He died for our sins. Yeah. He, 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 he came into the world to save us. He came into the world to give us eternal life. Amen. And so he said he's exalted, he's exalted and, and telling them about the goodness of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Then the Bible says that, uh, and with many other words, he testified and exalted, saying 
save yourselves from this unfought generation. Save yourselves from this crooked generation, this corrupt generation. We need to save ourselves from this corrupt generation. Yeah. You know, we, we, we don't hate people. We don't hate people. But we hate the sin that's taking place in the world. Yeah. We need to save ourselves from this untoward, this corrupt generation. All we can save ourselves is that we dedicate our lives to Christ. Amen. There's no other way. Amen. Amen. And so he says, then they glad to receive the word, were baptized. And the same day, listen to this, 3,000 people were added to the church. Oh, Boy, what, what, can you imagine that? Just by teaching the word of God, just by being in church, they pre preach the word, he preach the divine truth, and as a result of the divine truth, 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people got saved. Then it says that they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. See, when people get saved, what has to happen is now you got to get them involved in study. Now you got to get them involved in church. Now you got to get them in, in, involved in, in prayer meeting. People don't want to come in prayer. People don't want to come to Bible study. But in order to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you have to do those things. Amen. They're necessary for your growth. It's a spiritual food that we all need in order for us to develop. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And so he goes on to say uh, in verse 43, he says, And fear came upon every soul, and, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And he said, And they believed, and they had all things in common. Listen, they had all things in common. They possessed all things in common. Then they sold all things so that everybody had the same of everything. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Now, if we came together today and we said, now, we're going to sell everything that we have and we're going to put everything in common, us. Yeah. Somebody would say, uh-huh. I work too hard. They were like-minded. Mm -hmm. They were of one mind. They sold everything they had and then they brought everything together and they shared with one another. How unselfish was that first church? And we long for that today. We long for a church where people are helping one another. Amen. We long for a church where people are reaching out. We long for a church where we see somebody that has a need and we go and we help that person with that need. We're not waiting for the pastor to do it. We're not waiting for somebody, a leader to do it. Well, we just know because we're in fellowship with people, there's a need and you go to that person, you say to that person, hey, look, what can I do to help you? How, how can I help you? Because you realize that what you have, you didn't get it by yourself. God gave it to you. And whatever God gives you, God gives to you so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. You've been blessed to be a blessing. I've been blessed to be a blessing. Amen? Amen? And so they had everything in common, and, and they were selling everything. And, and the Bible says this. The Bible says that they went from house to house. Uh, they didn't eat meat, gladness, singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, as should be saved. We say add to the church. He says this. He says that word church in the Greek is ecclesia. It means called out. It means suffering. What he's saying here is that you and I, as a church, we've been called out. We've been separated. We're not a part of the world. We are separated from the world. We're the called out ones. And as the called out ones, we should be separated. Listen, we are a special people. Amen. We are a special people. We are called out ones. We are the ones that have been separated. And God acknowledges, God recognizes us as the ones that have been called out as ones that are suffered. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? And we fail to, to realize just how important uh, uh, that is. And so people should be helping one another. That's right. As the called out ones, as the ones that are separated, we should be helping one another. My sister-in-law, of course, was funeralized. Uh, had a celebration on Thursday and she was buried on, on, on Friday. But at celebration, this is what was said about her, that she was a servant leader. She was a minister in the church. But during COVID, you know what she did? She called people on the phone. She called and she asked them, the ones she knew couldn't get out, can I go buy groceries for you? Can I fix food for you and bring it to you? Mm -hmm. See, see, that's the way the church, the call out one should be doing reaching out to people and saying, how can I help you? How can I serve you? It doesn't matter what your position is in church. How can I help you? How can I, how can I make sure that you're taken care of? My, my, my wife, before she passed, uh, one thing she did, she reached out to everybody in the church. Amen. They knew they were going to get a phone call. At some point, somebody was going to get a phone call just to say, how are you doing? Is there anything that you need? She found out somebody need, had a need, would call and say, hey, look, how can we, how can we assist you with this? And, and that's what we should be doing as a body of called out ones, ones that are separated. We should be helping one another. Yeah. Reaching out, trying to find out how, how we, can, we can help. And this church that we see, this church that, that's forming here, 
This is a paragon. This is a model upon which all churches should be built. Amen? Amen. You know, we know things change. We know there's an evolution of things, but, but there are some core things that should always remain. If I look at a house that was built 10 years ago, it doesn't look like a house that's being built today. Mm. But one thing about that house, it still has the plumbing and electricity. The core of that house doesn't change. The foundation of that house doesn't change. It might look differently, but it doesn't change. When it comes to church, there may be an evolution of things because they won't always look the same. But the core of that church should always be the same. Amen. And so this is a paragon. This is an example by which all churches should be built upon. Amen. Amen. So people uh, should want to come back to church. Yes. People should want to come back to church. I'm not just talking about because of the pandemic. People should want to come to church. Yes. People should want to come into the house of worship. This should not be a place where people are looking at and saying, I don't want to go there anymore. It shouldn't be that kind of place. Yeah, things have changed, but it shouldn't be that kind of place. But why aren't people coming to church? Why aren't people coming to church these days? And let me just give you another reason why people are coming to church. One is that the gospel is not being taught the way it used to be taught. That's right. It's not being taught the way it used to be taught. Now the gospel is based on what you want to hear. What, what do you want to hear? What, what, what word do you want to hear? And so rather than teaching the Word of God, people are, uh, uh, are giving the Word based on what they think people want to hear. And so a lot of people won't go to church because they say, I'm not being taught what I need to be taught. Well, you're just in the wrong church. Y'all in the right church. Amen. 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 <laughs> Some uh, people won't come to church because they say they're tired of fake Christians. They're tired of fake Christians. They're tired of people saying they're Christians, but they act just like they act. They, they, they say they're believers, but they act just like the non-believers. Where the non-believers go, that's where the Christians are. You'll find them in the same place. Right. You'll go up in there in some place that you a, a non-believer is, and you go up in there and you see a Christian there, and they, they, you wonder what they're, what they're doing there. They say they're living a life just like I'm living a life, so what's the difference? Mm. What, what's the difference? They're fake Christians, they're uh, hypocrites. And because of that, people say, look, if they can act like that, and they call themselves Christians, then I'm, I'm okay. So people just don't want to go to church because they say there are a lot of fake Christians. P Christians who go off on other people. Christians who cuss like other people. Yes. Christians who, who, who do things like other people do things. Amen? Amen. And so because of that, they say, I'm tired of, I'm tired of, of, of this thing where somebody says that they're Christians. My wife told this story once. She said that, that there was an accident. And on this one car, there was a bumper sticker that said, Jesus is Lord. And so uh, when the police officer pulled up, there was one man who was just going up, just saying all kinds of things, just, just acting crazy, just all over the place. And then there was another guy who was just standing there. So the police officer walked to the man who was silent and then wasn't saying anything. And the man who was just carrying on and, and just going off, uh, he said, wait a minute, I'm the one that's been hit. You should be talking to me. So he looked at the car with the bumper sticker. He looked at the man. He said, well, I didn't think that was your car because the way you carry on. This old man standing here by himself, he's the one that's quiet and calm. But the way you're going off, it didn't match the bumper sticker. See, we, we have the label of Christ. <laughs> we have the label, but we don't have the fruit. And because we have the fruit, then it doesn't match. And people saying, there's no difference between you and me. There, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. Another reason why people won't come to church is because, you know what, they don't want to be bothered. Some people just don't want to be bothered. The Bible says this in Proverbs 14, 13. Uh, Where there's no oxen, the crib is clean. Mm -hmm. Where there's no oxen, the crib is clean. Think about this. Where there's no oxen, if they're in a crib, if they're in a stall, uh, there's nothing clean up. But if there's an oxen there, they make a mess. When they eat and everything else, they make a mess. And what he's saying is that when people aren't in your life, when people aren't in your life, there's nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. So I stay away from church because I have to deal with people, messy people. Mm -hmm. So I just stay away. I just don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with the, with the people at all. I just don't want to be bothered. The politics and the drama and everything that takes place in church that shouldn't be taking place in church. Uh, another reason why people don't want to come to church is because there's a, a, a lack of desire to be committed to living a holy life. Mm. Some people just say that's too much. I know before I got saved, I, 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 I was thinking that that was a lifestyle you had to live. 
that you know it was an ascetic life that meant you couldn't do much of anything. You couldn't swim. You couldn't play billiards. You know, very limited in what you could do. Just go, you know, just it was just kind of a boring life. And I, I, that was a picture I had in my mind. Yes. And little did I know that that just wasn't true. But people say, "You act is too much. How 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 can I live up to the standard of Christ? It's, it's too much." Well, you know, if you try to do it, I try to do it. You can't. We can't do it. But the Holy Spirit will enable us and empower us to do it. Amen? And, but we find out later, as we are uh, Christians, that there's a lot that we can do. You can shoot pool. Yeah. You can go swimming. Just cover yourself up the right way. Amen. But you can go swimming. Right. I ain't get too many amens on that one. <laughs> 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 but there's a, there's a uh, lack of desire to live a, a holy life. And, and what we're doing is we're competing with the world. The world has a lot of influence. The world has a lot of influence. And so there's a competition that's taking place. The world is trying to pull us. Mm. And then Christ, the Holy Spirit, is, is pulling us. And we're caught betwixt and between. We don't know what we want to do. But given a choice, it's always Christ. Yes. It's always Christ. Amen? Amen? Another reason why is that we don't want to be accountable to anybody. When you come to church and you become a part of the fellowship, you become accountable. I can ask you if I haven't seen you, where have you been? If I look at you and see that something might be going on in your life, I can ask you, are you okay? But some people don't want, they have that facade, they don't want to be accountable, they don't want people to know something going on. They don't want them to know they're in sin. They don't want people to know they need help, they're struggling with something. They don't want people to know they might be backsliding just a little bit. They don't want people to know anything, so there's a, they don't want people, they don't, just don't want to be accountable anymore. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Another reason is, uh, listen to this. We don't come to church. Even though there's online giving, you don't have to give. People say, I don't have to give. Mm. I'm not coming to church, so I don't have to give. Yeah. Why, why do I have to give? But we don't realize that when we don't give, we're not hurting church. We're hurting ourselves. Right. We're cutting off our own blessings. Yeah. Amen? I, I remember, and this is just the way I was, and people may not agree with this, but whether I came to church or not, I had self side. So if I didn't come that Sunday, I gave it the next Sunday. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Whatever I had purpose in my heart is what I gave. Yeah. So if I didn't make it, didn't make it endure, I still had purpose in my heart what I was going to give. Yeah. Amen? amen? And so people won't come to church because they don't want to give their money. A lot of reason why people don't want to come to church is because, listen to this, the flock has been scattered. Go to Jeremiah 23. Let me show you this. Jeremiah 23. Verse 1. Woe be unto pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, says the Lord. God has given a warning. Amen. He's saying to pastors, the, the, the leaders, that you better be careful that you don't scatter my sheep. How do you scatter sheep? You scatter sheep by lack of integrity. Yes. You scatter sheep by infidelity. You scatter sheep by lack of character and integrity. All these things. And, and you uh, cause people to stumble and to fall. And people start to be scared because they say, you know, uh, uh, I can't trust anybody anymore. I had all my confidence in this man and this woman, and I found out this about them. I found out that about them. And because of that, now the people are scared. They say, I don't want to have any part of the church anymore. I don't have anything else to do with, with church. And because they say they don't have anything else to do with church, that falls on the leaders in the church. He said, woe be unto them that scatter my sheep. Woe be unto them. So people have been scattered. People have suffered a, a lot of church hurt. A lot of church hurt. I was in Florida, South Carolina, having breakfast one morning when I was working. And I saw this man had his hat on. And I realized he was from Atlanta. And so we just took up a conversation. And I asked him, I said, uh, are you a part of the church in Atlanta? He said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I was. He said, uh, but my family left the church. We've been there 15 years. He said, but we love it. And he said we left because of, and I don't say what the reasons, we left because there were reasons that they couldn't stay there anymore. And so I said, well, you're going to church now. He said, I'm not going anywhere. Woe unto the shepherd, the scout, the sheep. Mm -hmm. And people scout, people haven't come back to church for years because of church hurt, because they put their confidence in somebody and they let them down. Amen? Amen. Another reason why people won't come to church is because, you know, a lot, when they, when they come to church, they find themselves now separated because there's so many cliques in the church. 
and they can't seem to penetrate the cliques. And so there's a group over here, and they won't let them in. There's a group over here, and won't let them in. And they're by themselves, and they come into the doors, and nobody says any, anything to them. When they leave, nobody says anything to them, because they say those people know each other, but they're not trying to get to know me because of the cliques. Mm -hmm. And because of the cliques, they won't, they won't be a part of a, of a church. Mm -hmm. And then one a last reason is this. People say this. God is allowing too many things to happen. I'm lost. I've lost my trust in God. God, I've been praying to you. I've been believing. And you know what? You don't answer my prayers. And because you don't answer my prayers, I refuse to come into another church. I refuse to do it. Look, look. Let me just tell you, so many people are falling away because they ask God for something and it didn't manifest. You know what? It will be easy for me to walk away from church. Today I can easily walk away from church. You know why? Because when my wife was dying, I was pleading with God. Save her. I was begging God, save her. Yeah. Fight, baby, fight. Yeah. We need you, fight. Lord, I walked down those hospital aisles, back and forth those, down that aisle, and I was screaming out to God. All over the church. I didn't care who heard me. All over the, the hospital. I didn't care who heard me. Lord, I need you to save her. I need you to raise her. Don't let her die. We need her. I need my wife. Yeah. It's easy for me to walk with the church. I refuse. Amen. And what happens is, because we're believing God for something, we want something from God, it doesn't manifest, and then we give up and we just walk away. Yeah. Listen, I don't know why what happened happened. I can't explain it. I'm not going to try to make up something. All I know is my wife isn't here today, and I don't know why. I, what I do know is that I'm righteous for God, I'm holy for God. And let me just tell you this, people everywhere are praying for her. Word got around, I'm telling you, when word got around, hundreds and hundreds all over the United States and Africa, people all over the world were praying for her. But she didn't live. And many times people will walk away from church because they said, God, how yeah. did you allow something like this to happen? Yeah. Yeah. How do you allow something like this? This church is such a wonderful person. How, how can you let a baby die? A baby that only been here three or four months. How you let a baby die? How you let people in cars when they're out on the highways? How you let them die? How, how is it that you let them die? How, how you let my husband, my wife be shot to death and, and nothing? They had nothing to do with anything. They were good people. And Lord, I pray. I've been praying to you for every day since I was a child. How you let this happen? People say, I won't come back to church because I stopped believing in God. What kind of God is this that will allow something like this to happen? Mm. So people won't come back to church because of that. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But let me just tell you, those are the reasons why people won't come to church. But let me give you some reasons why we should come to church. Amen. I want to go to church. Yes. Before my wife died, this is what she said to me. I want to go to church. I want to go to church. I said, we can't go to church. She said, we can go. I said, look. I said, we cannot go to church. It's too soon. And because that mutation was taking place. And she stayed on me, she stayed on me, and she, and I'm going to say that she, she coerced me. <laughs> she said to me, we're going to church. And I said, keep peace in the house, we're going to church. <laughs> so she said, when are we going? I said, when you want to go? She said, June the 6th. We opened up June the 6th. That was the first time we opened back up since March 22nd of, of 2020. And it was the last time she went to church. My wife got a chance to go to church before she died. Yeah. But we want to come to church because the Bible tells us, look at Hebrews 10.23. Let me show you this. Hebrews 10.23 through 10.25. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us continue to hold firmly the confession of our faith, the things that we're believing for, the things that we're hoping for. Let's continue to hold firm those things. Amen? Amen. He says that... Uh, not only let us hold fast by wavering, he said, but he is faithful, that promise. God is faithful. God's not a man, he's a lie. We don't understand why God doesn't do some of the things we want him to do, the things that we ask him to do, but God is faithful, that promise. Yes, he is. And we can't understand that. Mm -hmm. Then it says, and let us consider one another to provoke uh, unto love and to good works. In other words, let us stir one another up in love. Let us, let us stir one another up in love and and in good deeds. And then it says, it says, it says not, for assembling, not, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. He says, look, we should be coming together and we should be coming together as a body, as an assembly. 
as a congregation. So why do we want to come to church? We want to come to church because we're supposed to come to church to, to come together, to worship the Lord. We should be coming together, coming together. You know, there's nothing like coming together and having a great worship experience. Amen. You know, when you come to church, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with online. I'm not saying anything wrong with online. But when you come into a corporate setting where you're alive and there's intimacy, there's something totally different that can take place on church. Amen. When you sit in church and, and uh, somebody next to you is, and, and, and uh, they're praising God, don't you know that affects you? You can start to feel it yourself. Yes. You can start to feel it. You can start to, to feel what's taking place. Yes. You can actually start to feel it. Amen? amen. You, can, you can feel the other person. When they say, you, when they say, when they say amen, yes. when you feel somebody say amen, you start to feel that on the inside of you. Yes. You can feel the amens that are taking place. When somebody's lifting up whole their hands in church, when they're lifting up whole their hands, they're saying, Hallelujah! Bless you, Lord. That thing will jump off on you. It'll make you want to shout. It'll provoke you to want to worship God. It'll provoke you to make you want to bow down before him and worship him in praise and in honor. There's something about the corporate worship experience. When we come together, there's no more discord. There's no more division. When we come together in corporate worship, when we come together just to praise God and just to lift Him up, there's something that takes place. Joy comes in our heart. We forget about everything else that's taking place. Nothing else matters. We just want to worship Him. We just want to bow down before Him. We just want to tell Him how much we love Him. God, we love you. God, we praise you. God, we thank you that we are where we are. We magnify your holy name, O oh God. It's something about coming into the house of the Lord to worship. It's something about blessing God. It's an experience like none other. The, the online experience may be great for some people, but that wasn't what it was designed for. It was designed for people who couldn't get out. But those of us that can get out, we should be coming back yeah. to church. We should be coming back. We should be worshiping God. We should be in the assembly. But those that are suffering, those that have been called out, yeah. that's who we are. Yeah. And God says, come into my house. Come into my house and worship me. Yeah. Come into my house and enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let him dwell in this place. Let him make healing take place in you. Whatever you may be going through, God will get you through. He'll do it. God will do it. So he says, come into the house. Whatever your problem is, whatever you're going through, he says, it doesn't matter. I am here for you to enjoy my worship experience. So we come into this house. We want to go back to church. We go every place that we want to go. Not too long ago, right? Come on, wife did. We had the corporate suite. They were nice enough to get in the corporate suite. We got down there in the grave there with all those people. All those people. We had our own separate place. But we had all these people were around us. I went out to dinner with some friends just then. They invited me to dinner just to eat it. And when I got to the restaurant, it was an hour wait. You know, I don't like to wait an hour, but I waited an hour. And it was something about being in the ambiance of that place. And we enjoy the fellowship. God says this. If you can go to Walmart, if you can go to Pubs and Crows, if you can go to Aldi, if you can go to the mall, if you can do everything else you want to do, why can't you come to my house and worship me and appreciate me and love on me? Why can't you do it? I want to go back to church. I want to go back to church. Something about being among like-minded people. There's something about enjoying the presence. There's something about getting strength from all the people that gather together like coals in a grill. One touches another, it's hot. It touches something else, and it touches something else, and the next thing you know, the whole place is ablaze. God says this, let me set this place ablaze, this place called church. Let me set it ablaze. I want to go back to church. Can we give him a shout of praise?
To stay connected, please like our Facebook page, Good Works Christian Ministries, Inc., and subscribe to our YouTube channel, GWCM Media. If you're looking for ways to give, please visit our website at gwcm.info and click on donations. Or you can find us on the GiveLify app at Good Works Christian Ministries. The Word of God has gone forth, so please allow Christ to be seen in you. Thank you, and be blessed.